Welcome to Knowledge Book Radio with Marge Potasek. Marge was searching for the purpose of her life and the truth that would tie everything together to make sense of what was taught and what was happening on our planet, the fire that was creating all the smoke. Through many experiences, she was finally led to the knowledge book that provided all the answers. Marge is now talking about this gift to humanity on Knowledge Book Radio, so all can be united in peace, love, and harmony. This live call-in show at 1-800-930-2819 is amazing. So get ready to hear about the Knowledge Book. Here's your host, Marge Potasek. Hello, everyone. I'm Marge Potasek, and you are listening to the Knowledge Book Radio with Marge Potasek on Transformation Talk Radio. For the next hour, as we have been doing for a while, we will continue our series of Omega Talks that are usually given at the end of every month. And this is part of the unification program of the Call to Friendship Association mentioned in the Knowledge Book. Now, the purpose of these talks and the reason why we do these talks is that we, while doing this, we are connecting science and spirituality by discussing world knowledge and connecting it to the Omega Dimension. Now, the Omega Dimension is the 19th Dimension, as those of you who are reading the Knowledge Book know, and this is the dimension that has been opened up to humanity for the first time to us through the Knowledge Book. Now, this time, this topic for today's show is the Surrealists. But before we go on, let me just give you some websites for further information. Um, The United States website is www.usa.theknowledgebook.net. The Turkish website, the World Brotherhood Union website, is www.dkbdavidkiteboy-mevlana.org.tr. My contact information is 973-787-7035, email address mmjp99 at gmail.com. And the Call to Friendship website is www.calltofriendshipalloneword.org. If you visit the Call to Friendship website, you can see that this will be the fourth year that the Congress is held in Turkey. You could see uh, some information and videos from previous Congresses. It's a very interesting site and very, very good to see. Um, okay, and of course, if you have any questions or comments um, about what we are talking about today or we've talked about before, uh, please do email me, text me, or call me. And um, we will discuss now. Interestingly enough, some of the information that we are covering in this um, talk was actually suggested to me by one of the listeners. So thank you to her for doing this. And um, because of that, I myself have gotten you know a broader understanding of both the knowledge book and with the process by which we evolve. So again, any topics you would like to have covered or any questions you may have please contact me at 973-787-7035 or mmjp99, Mary Mary John Peter 99 at gmail.com. Okay, so we will start today's talk on the Surrealists. So let's, let's give a little overview as to what we'll be covering this time. So number one, what is Surrealism and when did it start? And what was the first manifesto? who is the father of Surrealism, and we'll talk a little about André Breton and his life and work, and why was Surrealism so important. We'll cover then some real Surrealist artists, then some very famous Surrealist artists, and especially we will be talking about, towards the end of El Salvador Dali, about the painter that entered the fourth dimension and going beyond the three-dimensional world. And in this context, there is a painting, if you look on your website, If you look through your um, search engine, look under Salvador Dali, um, the crucifixion. That's the painting I'll be talking about later on in this program. So surrealism, what is it? It's actually a 20th century avant-garde movement in art and literature which sought to release the creative potential of the unconscious mind. 
It's a cultural movement that started in 1917 and is best known for its visual artworks and writings. Artists painted unnerving, illogical scenes, sometimes with photographic precision, creating strange creatures from everyday objects, and developing painting techniques that allowed the unconscious to express itself. Its aim was, according to Breton, to, quote, resolve the previously contradictory conditions of dream and reality into an absolute reality, a super reality, or surreality. Now, when you look at some of the paintings, there is one painting that I'm looking at right now, and you think that you're looking at a depiction of a scene outside of a window. However, when you're looking at this scene, on the pane of glass itself, there seems to be like this little hash mark. And then when you look at the bottom of uh, below the windowsill, you see three um, stands. And then you begin to see the fact that it's not you're not actually looking at the outside through the window. You're look, actually looking at a painting that is supported by the easel in the window. So this question is, what am I looking at? Am I seeing what I'm seeing? Am I not seeing what I'm seeing? What is going on? And then the person who is looking at this questions, what's going on? How is it going on? When I'm, well, do I believe what I really believe? And is it something that I need to believe in? And what is else is there out there that I don't know about? Now, works of surrealism feature the element of surprise unexpected juxtapositions, and non sequitur. However, many surrealist artists and writers regard their work as an expression of the philosophical movement first and foremost, with the works themselves being an artifact. Leader André Breton was explicit in his assertion that surrealism was, above all, a revolutionary movement. It was an ad- started out as an anti-war movement of Dada and then eventually went into... Uh, a philosophical movement through um, André Breton. Now, up until 1924, there were two rival surrealist groups that had formed. Each group claimed to be successors of the revolution launched by Guillaume Apollinaire. One group of these surrealists was led by Ivan Gol, and the other group was led by Breton. Ivan Gol published his manifesto, A Realism, on the 1st of October 1924, And this is the first and only issue of Surrealism that he published. Two weeks later, Breton's Manifesto of Surrealism was published by editions of Sagittaire on the 15th of October, 1924. Now, these two gentlemen, Gaul and Breton, clashed openly. and They were literally fighting at one point at the Comédie des Champs-Élysées over the rights of the term Surrealism. Who owns it? Who came up with it? And who has the right to use it? And it turns out in the end that Breton won because he was more tactical in his approach and he had a much greater following. And from that point forward, the history of surrealism would remain marked by fractures, by resignations and resounding excommunications with each surrealist having their own view of the issue and goals however, accepting more or less the definition laid out by André Breton. So he was the leader of the philosophy, and he seems to be calling the shots and excommunicating people here and there every once in a while. So who was he? Where did he come from? He was a poet and an essayist, and he actually is especially known for as the theorist behind surrealism, the theory, the philosophy behind this movement. He was born on February 19th, 1896, in the suburbs of Paris, to a bourgeois family. His parents imposed a very hard Catholic education on him, and by the end of his adolescence in 1914, Breton takes the literary path. And the symbolist, Jean Renier, noticed the poems of young 18-year-old Breton and put him in touch with Paul Valéry. Then in the early 1920s, Breton broke completely with the Dada movement, disillusioned by the Dada ideas. At this time, the first Surrealist Manifesto, which would subjugate an entire generation of literary and visual artists, appeared. In 1919, in Paris, quote, the three musketeers, unquote, which were Breton, Aragon, and Philippe Sepol, who was a poet, founded the journal Literature, 
were the great names of the literature of the time, like Paul Eluard and Pierre Reverdy, participated. In this journal, the texts using the Surrealist techniques appeared. For example, the famous magnetic fields of 1920, where Breton started to experiment with automatic writing. A Surrealist manifesto was written by Breton and published in 1924 as a booklet. Editions du Sagittaire, and the document defines Surrealism as psychic automatism in its pure state, by which one proposes to express verbally by means of the written word or in any other manner the actual functioning of thought dictated by thought in the absence of any control exercised by reason exempt from any aesthetic or moral concern the text includes numerous examples of the application of surrealism to poetry and literature but makes it clear that its basic tenets can be applied to any circumstance in life not merely restricted to the artistic realm. The importance of the dream as a reservoir of surrealist inspiration is also highlighted. Breton also discusses his initial encounter with the surreal in a famous description of a hypnagogic state that he experienced in which a strange phrase inexplicable, inexplicably excuse me, appeared in his mind. Quote, there is a man cut in two by the window, unquote. This phrase echoes Britain's apprehension of surrealism as the juxtaposition of two distant realities, united to create a new one. The manifesto was written with a great deal of absurdist humor, demonstrating the influence of the Dada movement which preceded it. The text concludes by asserting that surrealist activity follows no set plan or conventional pattern, and that surrealists are ultimately nonconformists. In 1929, Breton asked Surrealists to assess their, quote, degree of moral competence, unquote, and along with other theoretical refinements, issued the Second Manifesto of Surrealism. This manifesto excommunicated Surrealists reluctant to commit to collective action. So you're either part of the group, part of the common philosophy, or you're out. Desnos and others thrown out by Breton moved to moved to the periodical documents edited by George Bataille, whose anti-idealist materialism produced a hybrid surrealism exposing the base instincts of humans. Now here's a quote from André Breton. Quote, Everything tends to make us believe that there exists a certain point of the mind at which life and death the real and the imagined, past and future, the communicable and the incommunicable, high and low, cease to be perceived as contradictions. So he's coming and coming and arising at arriving at a unification at a point at which everything makes sense and everything becomes a different reality of which we know not much, but we're but which the serialists are trying to connect to and show us. So why is surrealism important? Number one, it started humans on a quest. When you, look, when you look at a picture, when you look at a painting, and right now I'm looking at something that looks like the outline of a woman's face. So you see the eye, you see the eyebrows, so you see the outline of the jaw, the ear, the nose, the mouth. However, when you look at it, and I tend to see background before I see foreground, in the foreground there's actually a bird and a black panther, both sitting one on a tree, the other on a branch, and they seem to be in a mountain. So what am I looking at? Am I looking at a woman's face or am I looking at a cat or a you know, black panther? Am I looking at a bird? What is going on? Is this really um, a hill or a mountain or is that a woman's shoulder? So when you look at this, you start to question what the status quo is. Is whatever we know as the status quo what really exists? Is there something beyond that that maybe we can't see, we can't measure, and that we need to connect with? So basically, surrealism and the surrealists shock people out of their complacency of their own set ideas of reality. If you see something that's completely contrary to what you think, what you think and what you believe, then again you start to think, you start to question, you start looking for answers. The Surrealists produced works of art that were fantastic and very hard to understand or interpret. Some of the paintings that I've gone over, um, 
in preparing this, it was very hard to understand what the artist was trying to say. The only thing I could get was a feeling, maybe of anger or of war or something like that. Then, of course, the surrealists also presented the idea that other realities could exist, but are unreachable through our rational mind. So they started to use something that they called automatism, automatic writing, basically saying that if we go beyond what we can see, think, and feel, the measurable third dimension world, that there could something, something could exist outside of that, that does exist and we could connect with, but not using our rational mind. And the Surrealists, founded on the data, anti-war principle, and encompassed a rejection of the entire concept of reality as known at the time. So they were at initially very much against war and against the society and the ideas and the philosophies that created that war and allowed war to continue to, continue to exist. So when we look at the knowledge book, On fascicle 53, page 896, quote, Art carries the highest vibration of the evolvement code. Art does not have only a single aspect. Each branch has an art, but the origin is the same. But the artist creates himself, herself, in proportion with his, her creative power. Then that person does not need need a book, because she, he has become a book himself, herself, the genuine artist. Different mediums are prepared by different channels for everyone who has been able to reach the philosophical consciousness beyond art. In fact, we do not prepare these mediums. We only hold the hands of our friends who have succeeded in being able to reach us and who have transcended themselves. This is a universal rule. In other words, these artists and all artists are able, by their high frequencies, to delve into dimensions, to go to places, go to the unknowns that... We cannot because we're at maybe a lower evolution level that we don't have the same high frequency, have not not completed our evolutions yet, and they're able to come in, draw that knowledge from higher dimensions and give it to us in our dimension, shocking us in some way or being like a cattle prod, say, hey, what you're here and doing here is not necessarily what you think you're supposed to be doing. It's not necessarily what you are supposed to be doing here. There is something else out there. Maybe we should look at that as well. And again on page 897 of the knowledge book, quote, During the medium of sleep, your thought mechanism opens automatically, and this mechanism gets in connection with numerous channels. When it finds the channel appropriate to its own coordinate, the dreaming medium occurs. A normal brain commits that dream to memory and never confuses it with truth. A brain other than this can easily open its door to different mediums even when it is awake. In such cases, if the structure of the mind can connect its own control to automatism through the structure of the body, then that person is considered normal human. So this is what the surrealists, as far as I can understand, have been trying to do. They were trying to and maybe accomplish this feat of being able to open to through their channels to all other dimensions, as we usually do in dreams, to be able to open themselves to other knowledge and other ideas coming from different dimensions, and then being able then to present it to us in a form that will perhaps teach, that will teach us, that will show us the way. So again, the surrealists were doing the work that the knowledge book is explaining how they were doing it. And it ties in very well with their trying to connect with the unconscious mind, just like we're doing in our dream state. Now we'll go over some of the surrealist artists. Now, the surrealist artists aim to channel the unconscious in order to unlock their creativity and imagination. Influenced by psychoanalysis, they believed that the rational mind suppressed the power of the expression. Spanning visual arts, surrealism, photography, literature, and cinema, surrealism proposed that artists should bypass reason and rationality. These techniques became known as automatism or automatic writing, encouraging chance and spontaneity in artistic practices. 
So be it going beyond the box of what was considered normal at the time. Guided by Freud's emphasis on the importance of dreams and the unconscious, they employed a variety of motifs that rendered these notions. Each of the surrealist artists relied, sorry, relied on their own symbols, but their imagery could be often described as outlandish, perplexing, and even uncanny, jolting the viewer out of their comforting assumptions. From Max Ernst's obsession with birds and Salvador Dali's depiction of ants or eggs, or to Joe Moreau's vague biomorphic imagery, nature was the most frequent imagery. Regarded as one of the most versatile artists of the beginning of the 20th century, Jean Arp was associated with both Dada and Surrealism. He expressed himself in sculptures, paintings, drawings, collages, and poems. He is best known for his sculptures characterized by wavy lines that he often referred to as organic abstraction. Aiming to minimize the intervention of the conscious mind, he embraced chance and spontaneity as integral components of the artistic process. Although his work was non-representational, it was firmly rooted in nature. As a co-founder of the Dada movement, his organically inspired sculptures in the first Surrealist exhibition in 1925 played an integral role in linking the two movements, at the same time shaping the future of Surrealism. So when you look at his painting, it's basically flat, two-dimensional, dimen um, and it depicts what looks like clouds or could be blobs on a background. Then his other sculpture could be just basic ovals or circles that come out of the canvas. Um, and then his sculpture is rounded. And it's hard to describe as to what you're looking at and how what that was supposed to mean. Now, a provocateur and a shocking and innovative artist, Max Ernst, mined his unconscious for dreamlike imagery that mocks social conventions. Seeing the modern world as irrational, he made this idea the basic of his basis of his work. One of the first artists to apply Sigmund Freud's dream theories, he painted freely from his inner psyche to find the source of his creativity and unleashed his primal emotions. He also explored the universal unconscious with its common dream imagery. As a versatile and prolific artist, his work with the unconscious, his social commentary, and broad experimentation in both subject and technique was highly influential for future generations of artists. Then comes Yves Tanguay. He is known or is regarded as a quintessential surrealist in many respects. Yves Tanguay was an eccentric artist best known for his misshapen rocks and molten surfaces that lent definition to the surrealist aesthetics. He used a highly personal symbolism that reflected his interest in childhood memory, dreams, hallucinations, and psychotic episodes. Due to his love of nature, Tangi painted abstract, land, abstract landscapes populated by biomorphic shapes and painted in somber humes, hues. Balancing between realism and fantasy, his landscapes are characterized by a certain hallucinatory effect. He was preoccupied, preoccupied with dreams and the unconscious. He depicted the mind and its contents with naturalistic precision, envisioning the unconscious as a place. So he saw the unconscious as a different reality. However, that reality has its own particular structure and shape that could be represented. Then we have Man Ray. He was a very versatile and prolific artist. He worked in various media such as photography, painting, sculpture, film, prints, and poetry, and was influenced by Cubism, Futurism, Dada, and Surrealism. Yet, he is most famous for his photographs of the interwar years, especially the cameraless pictures he called rayographs. Operating in the gap between art and life, his photography relied on various techniques that blurred the line between dream and reality. Trying to create a surrealist vision of the female form, he utilized solarization, cropping, and overdevelopment to achieve a surreal effect of, in his photography. So if you look at these photographs, they don't seem like photographs. They seem like collages. They seem like 
an abstract something or other. Um, there is one that has a face and three huge like blobs or maybe four blobs of water on the person's face. Um, then there is a face that doesn't seem like a face. It's just a plain, blank, flat, two-dimensional shape with one eye that seems to be depicting three-dimensionality. But then there's something that looks like scratches or, or branches on the other side of the face. So it's hard to figure out what the artist is trying to figure and trying to say and what he is actually depicting. You have to start looking and, and um, maybe researching the artist themselves, what his philosophy was, and whether he had any notes at all as to what he was trying to portray in that particular picture or that particular painting or that art. One of the very early surrealists, André Masson, created art that defied classification due to its stylistic transitions. Exploring the automatic drawing and allowing his hand to move freely across the canvas without a conscious plan, he aimed to express the creative force of the unconscious. He would often work under strict conditions, for example, after long periods of time without food or sleep, or under the influence of drugs, believing this could force himself into a reduced state of consciousness free from rational control. He is also famous for his surreal portrayal of cruel confrontations and bizarre combats. His work has been decided as a bridge between surrealism and abstract expressionism. When I look at some of the paintings, I see anger, I see war, I see red, I see... Um, something not very pleasant to experience. Rene Magritte, the artist evoking mystery. A celebrated surrealist, brilliant painter, Rene Magritte, created works that are beautiful in their clarity and simplicity, but also provoke unsettling thoughts. Having an idiosyncratic approach to surrealism, he avoided stylistic distractions of most modern painting, settling on a dead pan, illustrative technique that clearly articulated the content of the work. He described his work as visible images that conceal nothing but evoke mystery. Featuring everyday objects placed in unusual context, his art challenges the assumption of human perception and forced the viewer to reconsider things usually taken for granted. Often employing interactions of textual and visual signs, he created works that often share a certain mystery that characterizes much of his surrealist work. So the painting that I'm looking at, or example of painting that I'm looking at, even though it may seem to be, you know, representation of three in third dimension with, with perspective, however it looks flat, you have a gentleman standing what looks like to be the edge of a bridge, However, the gentleman is dressed in a black suit and has black wings. And beside him or behind him on the pavement of the bridge, there is a lion seating peacefully on the bridge. So what's going on? Why does the man have wings? Why is he dressed in black? Why is the lion on the bridge? So you start thinking, you kind of start wondering what the, the um, artist is trying to portray. But the, it's not frightening. It's not, even though it's a lion... It's not frightening. It's not in a, he doesn't have an expression of, of looking like he's going to be getting up any second and, and striking something or someone. So, quote by Rene Magritte Everything we see hides another thing. We always want to see what the, is hidden by what we see. There is an interest in that which is hidden and which the invisible does not show us. This interest can take the form of a quite intense feeling, a sort of conflict, one might say, between the visible that is hidden and the visible that is present. So we see what we don't see. So you see a portrait of a man. Now, instead of seeing the man's face, you see an apple. So we see an apple, so it's something that is seen. We also see the man, but the man at the same time is hidden. There is also a, a portrait of that he produced that has two faces. Both faces are covered in material and they're kissing. So basically, and there is also another painting where you see a hat and shoulders, but the head and the neck is moved to a different position. And there's also another painting that he produced that basically there is a woman on one side of the painting and there's something 
if we look at Halloween and the way when children are dressed as Halloween ghosts where you have the sheet over her head, over the body, then this is what is depicted in his picture. So basically what are we seeing? That whatever we see actually hides something else. When we see a person, we cannot, we cannot see their thoughts. We cannot know their history. We cannot know where they were born. We cannot see anything that is hidden, even though we see that person in front of us. So our reality, what we see and what we feel and we can taste, touch, and measure is something that may hide and does hide something else that's going on. As we explore further in science, we are finding, and we have found, that our reality is actually nothing. There was something that was going on um, in the Internet where most of everything that we see is actually space, that if we compress everything that's on our planet and eliminate all the space that's in between the atoms and us, then all of it would fit into the size of a sugar cube. So again, the visible actually hides what the invisible is, and there is an invisible reality that we cannot at first and immediately see and sense. Now, this is a very famous painting that basically depicts what the surrealists were trying to depict. In his work, Magritte did, in fact, paint a pipe. However, the, the um, legend underneath says, this is not a pipe. So what he was trying to say and show to the viewer is that the pipe wasn't a pipe, but rather an image of the real thing. And Magritte's painting holds true to the surrealist style as it strips signs and symbols of their original meaning and would become one of the most iconic surrealist painting. So it's a pipe, but it's not a pipe. It's a drawing, but it's not a drawing. So it's not the real thing. It's a depiction of that real thing. So it's actually that, that pipe does not exist, but a real pipe somewhere along the line that looks like that does exist. So again, we're, we're questioning reality, we're questioning depiction, we're questioning everything. Then there is the Louis Buñuel. He's a pioneer of surrealist cinema. He managed to liberate the film from linear logical narrative. With an urgent, shocking, and visceral quality to his films, he never aimed to produce work that is too artsy. Portraying the disjointed visual narratives of human dreams in action, he has managed to perfectly capture everything that characterizes the dreaming state. With the emphasis on provoking... Intellectual and emotional responses, his films often affect the viewer physically as well. Destroying comforting assumptions about existence and reality, he has managed to evoke their most basic and hidden fears. Now, one of the films that he produced, and it's visible, and you can see that on the internet, basically, um, it's very shocking, and, and I'm not sure. When looking at that film, whether what actually was done was real, whether they actually really did that, or or there was some way uh, uh, some way of portraying this that really didn't happen, and basically it shows a razor being used to cut an eye. So um, talk about shock. There is another artist, a female artist this time, even though the serial seemed to be more on the side of all-male club. Leonora Carrington is regarded as both a key figure in the surrealist movement and an artist of remarkable individuality. And just like the other surrealists, she was interested in the unconscious mind and dream imagery. Her art is characterized by dreamlike and fantastical compositions of fantastical creatures. And looking at her pictures, it reminds me like of medieval art. You've got what looks like knights, but everything, and you have monks, but the monks have veils over their faces, completely covering their faces. You've got animals standing on edge. It all seems very unreal and weird, in a sense, which is, of course, the entire point. She also explored the idea of sexual identity and she rejected the frequent surrealist stereotypes that depicted women as objects of desire. 
depicting fantastic beasts and having themes of identity, metamorphosis, and magic as recurring. She blends various cultural influences such as Celtic literature, Renaissance painting, Central American folk art, and medieval alchemy. So these paintings of hers actually do remind me of the medieval period. However, it's very hard to make sense of what actually is on this painting. You'll have what looks like a cricket, but is the same size as a human. Then you have humans flying, or, or but however, the heads are triangular. It's, it's very difficult to see what's going on and what she's doing and how she's doing it. <clears throat> so now we come to maybe one of the most famous of the Salvador of the uh, surrealist painters, and that's Salvador Dali. He, of course, was renowned for his flamboyant personality and mustache and technical virtuosity. Salvador Dali is best known for his painterly output, but he also explored sculpture, printmaking, fashion, advertising, writing, and filmmaking. Despite being formally expelled from the Surrealist group in 1934 because of his reactionary political views, he is today most often associated with this movement. Basing his works on Freudian theory, Dali aimed to create a formal and visual language in his studio that could render his dreams and hallucinations. The act of tapping into, his, into the unconscious he described as, quote, critical paranoia, unquote. Obsessed with themes of eroticism, death, and decay, he is famous for employing ready interpreted symbolism encompassing fetishes, animal imagery, and religious symbols. So, of course, he's got this tremendous mustache that he's known by. Of course, his famous painting of the um, face of a clock, just like a Niagara Falls falling off a table. You have images of what may look like horses. However, the horses have huge, huge long legs, very thin at the bottom, thick at the top. Um, however, the horse itself has hind legs, that's his forelegs, and his hind legs look like human legs. There are other creatures, I think they're elephants, the three elephants. Again, they have long, long, very skinny legs. The whole thing is in this cloud formation, um, and there is a man holding a crucifix on the floor, on the ground. So it's, a, it's, it's fantastical imagery, and I'm not sure what he's trying to say in that one. There is another painting where there is a gentleman with a bowler hat. Top of his suit is black. The bottom of his suit is gray. Then you have the head of Salvador Dali with his mustache, and his body is that of Swiss cheese, a slice of Swiss cheese. Then you've got two what look like dresser drawers, um, however, they have clouds painted on them and a gentleman that is drinking some wine. And in the background, what look like UFOs and again, an elephant with extremely long legs. So it's very hard to decide what it is that he is depicting and what it is that he is saying. Now, there is an article that was sent to me by one of the listeners and in this article that was written by Fiona MacDonald, uh, the article was about Salvador Dali's crucifixion, or otherwise known as Corpus Hypercubus. And in that she states, quote, The Spanish artist had long found inspiration in science. He wrote in his 1958 Antimatter Manifesto, quote, In the Surrealist period, I wanted to create the iconography of the interior world and the world of the marvelous of my father Freud. Today, the exterior world is, and that of physics has transcended the one of psychology. My father today is Dr. Heisenberg. So he's got two completely different influences. One of the internal, the unconscious. The other is the external or the third dimension world and the world of science. And I continue, quote, Although Dali continued to explore ideas of theoretical physics until his death in 1989, Arguably, the greatest expression of his scientific curiosity came in the form of a 1954 painting. Hovering eerily in the air above a figure modeled by Dali's wife, Gala, Jesus Christ appears in a pose that has been painted by artists for centuries. 
yet there are no nails in this image of crucifixion, and the cross is not made of wood. It's not even in a dimension we can see. End quote. Quote, Corpus hypercubus was not an easy problem to solve, unquote, says Banchoff, the Brown University professor who worked with Dolly for about 10 years. Quote, it took him four years before he was satisfied with the painting. The length of the time definitely means that every aspect of the painting was meticulously thought out and depicted. So there was no accident in depicting the cross as he depicted it and the figure as figures on the painting as that as he depicted. And he actually was basing his work on his depiction of the hypercube um, on a medieval mathematician who first produced the idea of the shape of the cross as Dali depicted it. Now, Dali's floating cross is what Banchoff describes as, quote, an unfolded four-dimensional cube, end quote. In a 2012 lecture given at the Dali Museum, Jans Banchoff explains how the artist was trying to use something from a three-dimensional world and take it beyond. The exercise of the whole thing was to do two th perspectives at once, two superimposed crosses. However, it appears that there is also a two-dimensional cross created by the shadow of the hypercube. So when I was looking at, when I was reading this article and looking at this cross, number one, it became obvious to me that there is a cross on the bottom. And when you look at a color representation of this cross on the internet, what you notice is that the floor itself is a black and white tile. And each one of those tiles is... Um, a black has four whites around it, and a white has four blacks around it. However, there is one place where the cross is a cross. It's a flat cross at an angle. However, that color is reddish. So he is even trying to emphasize the fact that this cross that is on the bottom, which is in two-dimensional form, is actually also a depiction of a cross, but in the second dimension. So the two-dimensional, we have a two-dimensional cross on the floor. We have a three-dimensional cross, which is the figure of the person that's hanging or suspended in midair. And then you have the, the three-dimensional representation of the hypercube. Okay. So just as the size of a cube can be unfolded into six squares, a tesseract or four-dimensional cube can be unfolded into eight cubes. While it's difficult to grasp, the idea of multiple dimensions allows scientists to envisage shapes that mathematician Marcus Dussautoy calls sculptures of the mind. So for me, <clears throat> when I think of a square, if you put six squares together and they becomes third dimensional, becomes a cube. Then if you open up that cube and flatten it out, and each of those flattened pieces, the six, so that you have a flattened piece in the second dimension, you have two jutting out pieces and four lengthwise pieces. That's your cross. If each one of those becomes a cube, plus two cubes from front and back, that's your tesseract. That's your hypercube. Now, according to the Wikipedia, in geometry, the tesseract is the four-dimensional analog of the cube. The tesseract is, the, is to the cube, so let me start again. The tesseract is to the cube as the cube is to the square. Just as the surface of the cube consists of six square faces, the hypersurface of the tesseract consists of eight cubical cells, eight cubes. So the, now, interestingly enough, when I was reading this article... I also remember that, well, the knowledge book talks about the cross. However, it uses three words to basically represent the cross. And each of those three words actually has a different meaning behind it. And what I found fascinating was the correlation. Now, fascicle three of the knowledge book in pages 36, 37, and 38 gives knowledge about the cruciform. The Turkish word for cruciform is put. And the cross, Turkish word is haç, and the crucifix, which is istavros. Now, quote from the knowledge book. The form of the cruciform, this is the shape, the two-dimensional shape, 
is a shape that unifies the ground with the sky, and it is positive energy. As we have said before, this shape symbolizes the unification of the firmament to the earth. Quote, so again, I'm going to repeat without my commentary. The form of the cruciform is a shape that unifies the ground with the sky, and it is positive energy. As we have said before, this shape symbolizes the unification of the firmament to the earth. How is this accomplished? The cruciform, the shame of the cross, the shape of the cross, the two-dimensional shape of the cross, symbolizes the teaching mechanism, the mechanism of influences whereby teachers like Moses, Jesus Christ, Muhammad are sent with knowledge to raise the consciousness levels of their society. And not only great teachers like those, like Muhammad, Moses, and Jesus Christ, but also enlightened beings like those that have finished their evolution, and for example, like the Surrealists, have come back from higher dimensions to prepare humans for the next dimension. So the hot the put, the two-dimensional cross, basically symbolizes the path, the means by which the methodology, the teaching method by which humans are prepared for the next dimension and allow them to grow and access knowledge from the higher dimensions. And the second word is cross or hatch. And this triangle code symbolizes the evolution of the human. The message of cross is as follows. Those who embark on a quest with sincerity and goodwill have become emblazed. That is, they have been blazed in the essence heart, like Eunice's, Mivlana's, and all the saints. Then they have become a light and have illuminated the human in all aspects. This third dimension is depicted by the figure that is suspended in the form of a cross with the four three three dimensional cubes on the same plane. So the figure of the figure of the man is hanging, it's suspended in air, there are no nails anywhere, and there are four three-dimensional cubes that are basically floating in front of his body. Although we immediately assume that this figure is Jesus Christ, when we look more closely, there is no gash in his chest, there is no beard and no shoulder-length hair, or even a face that we customarily associate with his depiction. Um, the face, we only see a side view of the face of looking up to a face and the face is looking away to the side. So we can't even understand what this human is. So my question is, is, or my consensus is, is that it could be said that this figure stands for humans who are currently suspended in the third dimension, either poised to leave to higher dimensions or possibly obsessed by the third dimension. In either case, humans undergo evolution starting from the third dimension or world dimension, starting from zero world frequency. So this human has the choice of either following that path of the put of the cross or the cruciform and getting himself out of the third dimension, or they could get stuck forever in the third dimension and in the chaos of the third dimension. So, and then of course, the third word is crucifix or istavros. And the message, according to the knowledge book, is as follows. One, the human is elevated to his, her God through love. Two, she, he dives into the medium of quest by revelation, inspiration, and logic. And from there, she attains his, her Lord. Three, the final message, attain the consciousness of Almighty, the Absolute, and time. Transcend yourself and comprehend the cause of your existence. This word gives you to yourselves and it reminds you of the cause of your existence. So this is the fourth dimension, depicted by the Tesseract, the hypercube painted by Dali. The fourth dimension is where peace and happiness is found, and it lies beyond the chaos of the third dimension. Um, <clears throat> okay, and when we go back to trying to understand what's going on, so we have different dimensions. Two dimension are, is one, third dimension has three, so you have the X, the Y, and the Z axis, that's the third dimension, and the fourth dimension, you have the time, there's the movement through space. So this is what the fourth dimension depicted by the hypercross is talking about, and when the knowledge book explains the meaning of the word istavros, or crucifix, this is where time comes in, so it's definitely the fourth dimension that is being described. So, Dali's own sculpture of the mind brings geometry into the realm of the metaphysical. 
quote, there is a meditative intensity to crucifixion, Corpus Hypercubus, says art critic and poet Kelly Grovier. The painting seems to have cracked the link between the spirituality of Christ of salvation and the materiality of geometric and physical forces. It appears to bridge the divide that, men, that many feel separates science from religion. By breaking out of three dimensions, the artist could find new meaning in a traditional biblical sense, argues Dussotoy. The idea of the fourth dimension existing beyond our material world resonated for Dali with the spiritual world transcending our physical universe. So, in conclusion, a surreal, surrealism did start humans on a quest as the great artists succeeded in shocking people so they could grow out of their current ideas of reality into new and expanded consciousness and dimensions. And the knowledge book also does the same thing. It tells us information, tells us the truth, gives us knowledge that expands our conscious, that expands our knowledge base, that expands our understanding of how things work, what they are, and how things are put together. So, surrealism presented the idea that other realities could exist but are unreachable through our rational mind, that there is some other connection that we need to make, some kind of unconscious connection, some kind of maybe subconscious or maybe super conscious connection that exists that we could connect to other dimensions, other realms with our thoughts and with our minds. And artists like Salvador Dali were able to reach the unknown and depict in symbolic form knowledge about salvation and the cross that was to be given in the knowledge book and later in the 20th century. So for me, this was my own little quest. In other words, I got this article, started to think about it, then remembered that the knowledge book mentions the cross and somehow I was able to put the two together and then I saw that Salvador Dali, whether he realized what he was doing or not, he was actually giving knowledge in symbolical form that the knowledge book was giving to us right now. So he was depicting for us the two-dimensional cross which is a methodology, a teaching method of being able for us to reach higher dimensions because those entities come in from those enlightened entities, those entities who have finished their evolution come in from higher dimensions to jar us, to push us, to um, motivate us to actually move out of our current dimension and go higher. And it also gives us a second um, dimension the, the third dimension, which is the dimension where we are doing our evolution. And sometimes our evolution does feel like we're being crucified. You know, I'm not being sacrilegious, but the idea is that we have to go through our experiences. We have to learn the lessons in this, in the hard knocks of life to be able to actually understand where we are, what we're doing, and where we're supposed to be going. Okay? And then, of course, we've got, of course, the knowledge that the fourth dimension does exist, and that fourth dimension is where peace is. This is where happiness is. This is where we can aspire to go to. And if we finish our evolution, we could go there. So artists like Salvador Dali were able to, and this is what really surprised me and actually enabled me to really understand what the three words, the knowledge book for put, hatch, and istabros, or cruciform, cross and crucifix actually stood for. I couldn't understand it before. I read it many times, but it finally hit home. And the knowledge book on page 896 says, the happiest people are those who are able to find the dimension they deserve by their own high frequencies. who attain existence in unity. From now on, more appealing doors will be open to them and they will be submerged in everlasting happiness. So who are the surrealists? They are the cattle prods. They are the they were the ones and are still the ones, those who practice surrealism, who do this work, who enable us, who shock us, who get us to move, to get us to think, to get us to figure out things on our own. Now, another thing the knowledge book says is that in fascicle 2, everyone needs someone else. 
we are in our own dimension in our own time and we cannot move out of our dimension unless someone else helps us out of it. So we cannot do this by ourselves. Everything has to be done in conjunction with someone else and we need someone else to actually get us going, to get us motivated, to get us out there. And now it looks like this is all the time we have for today. Please remember that the uh, uh, Call to Friendship Knowledge Book is www.calltofriendship.org. The, the um, Turkish website is dkb mevlana.org.tr The United States website is www.usa.thenowledgebook.net My information is 973-787-7035 and mmjp99 at gmail.com That's Mary Mary John Peter and thank you for listening and we'll see you next time. Thank you. You've been listening to Knowledge Book Radio with Marge Potasek. Marge was led to the Knowledge Book, a gift to humanity, and its time of transition to the golden age that provided the truth and energies and frequencies. Now, she shares information from and answers questions about the Knowledge Book with you each Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. For more information, visit Marge at usa.theknowledgebook.net. Views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of the station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio.